I've never heard anyone say, oh, things are just getting so much slower. Everything is always up. It's moving forwards. That's how life works. Things just speed up. When we're sleeping, we're not absent. It's a different cognitive state. Hello and welcome to this BFI at Home event. BFI at Home is an online program available on the BFI YouTube channel with a range of film and television Q&As and panel discussions. It's updated every week. I'm Mark Kermode and I'm delighted to be joined tonight by Max Richter and Yulia Ma to talk about a number of projects including Voices and Sleep. Max and uh, Yulia, where do we find you? Where are you? We're in the very north of Oxfordshire, aren't we? Just kind of on several borders up here, but just in Oxfordshire, yeah. yeah. Middle of the field, Mark. <laughs> I'm very impressed by the fact that I can see behind you there's a there's a reel-to-reel tape recorder, which, is that is that something that you're using, or is that there as a prop? Um, well, it, it's one of several tape recorders, uh, and this one is um, uh, currently... In, in sort of prop status because it burst into flames. <laughs> it literally burst into it flames the last time I used it. So it's been relegated slightly. Um, yeah, it's a sort of incendiary oh, device. Um, <laughs> I'm sorry, how how did it I I mean how did it burst into flames? I've come across a lot of reel to reels. I've never had one catch fire. Well it's really old, you know, and the what and the, the insulation in the motors, you know, I mean it's from the what is it, mid seventies kind of thing, so Reebok. Yeah. And um, it was the funniest thing because I recorded this just, you know, this just testing um, some new tape and I recorded a bit of Schubert just off the radio and I was like, oh, that's lovely. And then I left it, left it there and then I was like, what's that smell? And then I turned around and there were flames coming out of this thing. And I was like, I'm pretty sure it's not meant Fire to do alarms. that. It's not really meant to do that, you know. So, um, so yeah, so right now it's just an inert object, but um, it's a nice Much reminder. Much loved inert object, which is why it's staying Yeah, in it's a sort of nice reminder of the virtues of tape. And the only thing I can think of that's similar to that, I had a, I had a video cassette recorder. I've got loads and loads of videos, and, um, and at some point that caught fire. But that's the only time I've had a piece of equipment like that actually burst into flames. The f- so the first thing to do is establish how your working relationship uh, work so you know Max you're a composer Yulia you're a, an artist a filmmaker curator how do the two of you work together because obviously you live together you have a life partnership how does your working partnership work well, I think it's it's taken many forms over the years I mean we've been together 30 years now Mark so it's been a long journey and and it changes throughout time you know it started off very much as a kind of two artists working side by side on quite different projects but constantly in conversation then it became more of a kind of laboratory of joint ideas, didn't it? And then hmm. it's, it, yeah, it's, it has many different facets, really. Of yeah. I, I mean, I feel like the, the idea of sort of um, collaboration in a formal sense, you know, now we're working, now we're not working. I think that's, that sort of doesn't really apply, to be honest, because, you know, obviously our life is conversations, you know, it's just sort of chatting, exchanging ideas, thinking about things, talking about things. So... The idea of sort of working together is a little bit, that, that seems more like, uh, you know, sort of false in a way, you know, it's more about just sort of being together and existing together and we're both, you know, creative people, so... We often wake each other up in the middle of the night with ideas, won't we? And yeah. <laughs> so, listen to this. Yeah. Um, so, yes, yeah, so it's ongoing and, 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 and takes many forms. I mean, there are times when we sit down and formally discuss projects as well, you know, when there's something coming mm-hmm. up. Like we did a festival at the Barbican, the Sounds and Vision, Visions Festival, and we did sit down at a table with pen and paper and kind of move things around and, and discuss every option and mm. every way of looking at things. So it, we do it that way too. And does the fact that it has that, you know, what you're referring to as a kind of, you know, an organic nature to it, does that affect the work itself? Because there's a couple of specific works that we're going to talk about, one of which is sleep, the other is voices and some other stuff. Those both feel like projects that came about organically rather than came about from somebody sitting down thinking, what do we do next? Mm. Yeah. I mean, voices, in a way, we have... It's, they're actually, they're very similar. The way sleep starts and the way voices start is very similar in that we both come at the topic but from different angles and suddenly it meets in time. I mean, for, for me, 
the Universal Declaration of Human Rights has been something that's been very much part of my life ever since I was born, really, because I was born in a socialist country, and obviously, you know, with, with people in uniform and guns on the street and, and kind of limitations on, on movement and all sorts of things. And I was raised by a humanitarian grandmother who had, who had herself been a refugee. So that's been part of my life ever since, since I was small, and I've carried it through with me as I had to come to this country. And for Max, it was more a kind of theoretical beginnings to this conversation and looking at the situation in Guantanamo and thinking about that. And so, and that's kind of, it, there's a point where it suddenly comes together. And it was the same with sleep in a way, you know, I'd been thinking about, I'd been falling asleep to Max, Max's concerts as they were being streamed around the world. And I came to him with this idea, but he'd actually already been working on something very similar himself. So yes, it's, it's kind of organic, isn't it? Mm, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. For those who haven't um, encountered voices, you're currently working on. There's a film project. Obviously, you can the 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 oral project exists already, and it's it's a it's a wonderful thing. I mean, not least because the words are so stirring, and it is as I think Max has said, something designed for a world turned upside down. Explain to those who who haven't yet experienced it what it is and how the film is going to work out. Why don't you start with voices? Yeah, so, well, Voices is, um, it's a music and film uh, project, visual and uh, music project, based around the text of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. So this document, which comes out of the Second World War, um, was drafted uh, 1948-1949, um, and forms the basis of a lot of the ins uh, the international institutions in the post-war era one way or another you know it's a very idealistic vision out of a very dark time and um, in a way we're living through a very challenging time you know a very dark time where a lot of things certainties things we relied on seem to be evaporating and have been eroded and I thought um, you know we need something inspiring and positive and so the text of the declaration is, you know, something we can kind of all get behind and all agree. <laughs> and uh, so we decided to, yeah, make this piece, which was in a way a space to reflect on that, uh, the sentiments of that declaration and uh, the hopefulness of that. One of the main things, Mark, that we were thinking about is that actually um, nobody's read the declaration. <laughs> you know, most people, have, most people know of it as ex existence, but we kind of other it. It's about people in other countries who are facing atro atrocious situations. And it is, of course, incredibly relevant to them and sets a kind of worldwide norm. But it also refers to us and our lives. And in, in, in the UK, in, in America, very, very few people have actually read these words. Mm -hmm. And that's what we were aware of, weren't we, when we were, yeah. when we were working on this project, is we, that we wanted people to hear the actual words. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's been a main emphasis of it. All human beings are born free and equal in dignity and rights. They are endowed with reason and conscience and should act towards one another in a spirit of community. Everyone is entitled to all the rights and freedoms set forth in this declaration without distinction of any kind. One of the things that I found remarkable about listening to it is that if you sometimes if you, if you hear a piece of music and suddenly there's a theme that you recognise and you go, oh, that's where that's from. Hearing the words of the declaration, there were suddenly phrases and whole sentences. Oh, no, I did know that. I just didn't realise I didn't realise the context in which it came. And I actually thought that provided a really interesting um almost musical form to the words that the, the, the words are like a song that you kind of heard but you've forgotten that you knew that's right yeah it's it's funny actually when we when we played it um at the barbican uh, early february right before lockdown um one of the things that um you know a lot of people in the audience said is that they they sort of knew bits and bobs of it they didn't knew pieces of it but they hadn't they didn't really know the text and that it was wonderful to kind of spend time with that text and I think that, yeah, that is one of the experiences um, that the, the project offers. You know, it's this idea mm. that you know, actually people connecting into this thing which they sort of vaguely know about, but they don't really know it. 
And when you do the live performance, what is the what's the visual element? What what were the audience watching while they were hearing the music and the and the live? Because live? because we ran out of time, <laughs> they're watching the orchestra. <laughs> My fault. <laughs> so fault. The, so the dream the, the dream was at the beginning, Mark. The dream was that you know in yeah, February we would be finished. It would be perfect. You know the music would be done. The film would be done. It would be perfect. But the thing is, right. I was supposed to finish that music, you know, six months before February. And I just, I, you know, I just, it just took a lot longer. It was, it was a difficult project to get done. And so I finished the music four days before the gig, <laughs> um, which isn't really enough time to make you know, an hour of film. So, um, so basically what the version we made in February was um, a kind of first draft, a kind of working version, a work in progress mm. version. And, um, you know, the, the Yuli's been developing the, the visual language since then. Really. It was really interesting for me, though, actually watching it in that state, because mm. I realised one of the most beautiful things about watching this performance is watching the 70, because there are 70 people playing on stage, is yeah. watching how everyone's interacting. And I always love that anyway about Max's concerts, when you're watching the little looks that musicians give each other. But to see this whole kind of movement going through the orchestra and, and the voices coming in, and, and it, it was so remarkable watching that. So I think it, that must hmm. well have to be incorporated somehow. But yeah. And what can we expect of, of the visual side of it? Obviously, literally four days after the show or something, Britain locked down. So initially I was going to start working on the visuals straight away and then um, as we entered lockdown and it was quite a strong lockdown at the beginning wasn't it um, I realized that I had to start making footage that used a very different technique so I started using found footage and stock footage and library footage and all sorts to come up with these two little videos that have already come out which is mercy and all human beings and they will they bear a strong relationship to what will eventually be in that I'm using rhythm a lot and using repeti- repetition of imagery and and obviously centering on human beings um, but I think in the final film it'll it'll um, um, I'm, I'm waiting to shoot more original footage to go back to a kind of the vision that I originally had for it which is a much more um, poetic vision of the whole thing and so we'll move in that direction when you say found footage, where is the footage found from? Because I've been watching your videos, and uh, I mean, for example, this 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 stuff which looks like it's kind of old uh, Super Eight that looks like it's been found in a in a personal family archive. Is it or is it created? that one? Isn't actually that funny enough? The Super Eight footage is not. It's found in the stock library. I went. I mean, it literally. It's really interesting. I spent weeks looking through footage. I mean, there is so much footage that exists in the world already. And I spent weeks and weeks for those two little videos. And what's fascinating is how beautiful so much of it already is, actually. And that little moment of that little old, that which I placed it between, of course, it has in real life that man is is different person. It, no, no, but, but in my film, he's thinking about a wedding, his wedding, hopefully. And yeah. it's such a beautiful bit of footage, isn't it? This bride sweeping up the mm. uh, pathway and and smiling back, and it's just like. This is so beautiful. Or the two kids on the phones together, you know. So actually, that's there's so much of it already in existence. I quite like that idea of this kind of environmental filmmaking, which is pre using pre existing footage to create new visions. Hmm. So yeah. And I do you do you investigate the origin of where that stuff comes from, or is part of the attraction of it that you, that you don't know? Both. It was really interesting because each imagery carries within it its own little story, doesn't it? And at first I was troubled by that. I thought, well, what does this mean if I'm using this imagery for something these people... I mean, they've, they've, all, they've all signed away that they want their imagery to be used, but what does it mean? And then I actually fell in love with that idea of the fact that I don't quite know who these people are because mm-hmm. it makes it even more relevant, the words, you know, that no matter what these people might say or talk about in their lives or the opinions they ha- might hold or the politics that they might talk about, these words are relevant to all of them. And I love mm. that in the end. But I did go, but I did investigate a lot of it. And there are, re- and I use that in a way. Like for instance, there's a, where Kiki Lane starts talking, I use a man and he's sitting with an American flag behind him. He's a black man, he's sitting with an American flag behind him. But if you look carefully, the flag is the wrong way around which is a sign of the Air Force. 
And it's actually an I know, but nobody else will know he's actually sitting in an AA meeting. And so actually the word, the image then has a whole different set of meanings. That man will be proud of his, the American flag. He'll be proud probably of the service that he's done. Um, but we don't necessarily see that. And, and I, I like that. I like the fact that there are many layers in the film because of that. Let's talk a little bit about sleep. Um, there's obviously been a you know a, a feature film uh, describing performances of sleep, which is remarkable, not least because I think it is the first time I have ever seen an audience listening to a piece of music whilst in cots, in beds, you know, inside or outside, sleeping through it. And I confess that uh, after watching the film, I did do the thing of sleeping through sleep. Um, which was very peculiar because, of course, I didn't really sleep. It was an entire evening, but I kind of night, but I kind of woke and slept and woke and slept. Now, you said that you had quite often fallen asleep listening to to, to to concerts. Max, do you want to say something about how sleep came about as a musical project? Because it's, I mean, it is true that the music does accompany a lovely night's sleep, but I've listened to it awake more often than I've listened to it asleep. <laughs> right. Yeah, I mean, I guess the musical starting point for, for sleep is really twofold. Um, I mean, the first thing is obviously, you know, as Yulia mentioned before, her experience of, you know, being at home and listening to me if I was playing in another time zone, you know, the music would be coming to her in the middle of the night. So there's this sort of weird late night boundary zone of awake being awake and asleep and listening to music and having music populate that space so that's one thing and then the other thing really is um, I guess uh, I mean this is going back five six years now to the origins of this piece when when we when I uh, when I sort of finally put it together um, uh, my feeling that we were getting kind of data saturated and you know creative works music movies books they can in a way provide a kind of a holiday from that sort of data blizzard that we're in um a bit like you know if i go to if i'm standing in front of one of the you know a big rothko painting you know it monopolizes your consciousness and it sort of blocks out all that noise that we normally live in and i think a piece of music can do that as well so i wanted to make a piece of music which could be like a place to rest a sort of mini holiday um so that was the big starting point and then I investigated you know the, the neuroscience of sleep and how sound and you know mind states could be uh, connected and uh, all of these things kind of came together in this uh, yeah this big piece. I think the thing that surprised people Mark a lot about the concerts is that um, they're played very loud they're not it's not really it's not about a sleeping aid it's about an experience of the night mm. yeah. and that whole sleep that whole idea of sleep being as a sleeping aid really came from journalists who were writing too quickly and, right. then, <laughs> and would yeah. interview Max and go home and write this thing and it was like no that's not what we, it's not really, <laughs> not really, really what it is but yeah. it's become that for some for a lot of people too and that's okay as well but it was it was never written originally for that it was more as this kind of um, journey through the night and 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 it really is incredibly effective like that in that way because people do go on this great big emotional journey when they're when they're sitting there mm. or sleeping through it. Mm. Um, but yeah, yeah, that always takes people by surprise. Yeah, that's it? right. I mean, I remember doing all the interviews at the time, and you know, two things people would say is, okay, so it's a, kind of a sleeping pill. It's like a sonic sleeping pill, and then they'd say, and what are you doing now? And I'm like, I've just written eight and a half hours of music. <laughs> you know, I'm going to have a rest. Well, I feel, be I feel better now about the fact that I said I didn't really manage to sleep through it because, and I, I apologise for repeating the joke, but it is a, it is something that is taught, and you know, and it is true that during the the film of sleep, we do see people in what appears to be a state of sleep, albeit in an outdoor park. Um, but as I said, it's that weird thing: you're not actually asleep. You may be lying down with your eyes closed, but you're not asleep because you are actually listening to the piece. Yes, and that's that's what that it came, comes back to the thing that when I was listening into these live streams of Max, you know, I was, I was saying to him afterwards that it's 
that's why it's such an incredible emotional experience because you're you haven't got your normal guard up <laughs> so mm. you're listening but you're not listening in the same way at all and because you're drifting in and out of sleep it, it kind of it you absorb it almost through your skin at some point mm. and that's a really different experience and that's mm. that's what we're finding in these that in these concerts as well is that people come out the other side and it's a very different listening experience for them mm. ritual which shifts your state of mind. It hits your soul. It makes me feel connected to this world. Music is my vehicle for getting through life. I write music to do that. The film of Sleep draws very heavily on a very rich archive of footage um, that Yulia, you have obviously kind of kept. Have you have you always been somebody who archives in that way? Are you somebody who naturally records things visually as a matter of course? I come from a filmmaking family. I was born into a large filmmaking family. My father's a film director. He made 25 feature films. My, my uncle's cameraman. And so the, light, the idea of looking at life through a visual lens is really natural to me. One of my first memories is of being on a film set when I was four and having to act in some film. <laughs> so I've carried that through and I think I've, I've you know, my, I've, I've been taking photographs and filming things for as long as I can remember. And that was always part of our lives together has been, you know, before, before everything, I was, I had a super eight millimeter diary that I was taking all the time as well. So yeah, so there's a there's a really huge archive here of, of our lives together, mm -hmm. and our projects especially. I should say I I'm I know people from filmmaking families who are absolutely the other way. That having grown up around people that filmed and made films, the last thing they want to do is ever to be on camera. It, it is well, that's also that... true for me. That's also <laughs> true for me in that I've avoided going into the film industry very much for that reason. I mean, it's a horrible industry. And when you've lived <laughs> it, when you've lived through 25 feature films we made, um, you it's, it's really horrendous. And so I know very well what it's like. So I always was using cameras in quite alternative way and remain like that, actually. I've no interest in making a traditional feature film or anything like that. So yeah, so both. And Max, what about your relationship with cinema? Because um, one of the things that we learn about in the documentary is that you kind of you kind of turned to cinema because it was expedient and you discovered that you could do it. And yet you are, as you know, one of my favourite contemporary film composers. I'm a huge fan of your, of your work. But I thought it was quite funny to hear you sort of say, well, I did it because it kind of paid the bills. Well, it, it does. It did start that way. <laughs> it did start that way, Mark. You Apart know, from Waltz. I mean, I, I, you know, it, it started in a way by accident. Um, I never set out to be a film composer. I never trained to be a film composer. I love cinema and I love music. And of course, you know, I, I'm aware and have an awareness and love for film music. But it was never something I wanted to do. Um, I got the call to do Waltz with Bashir uh, from Ari Folman, who just basically just kind of cold called me, just, you know, sent me the trailer for his thing. And I thought it was amazing and um, was a beautiful experience. You know, first project, absolutely brilliant. Um, and, you know, this is at the time of, you know, I'd made the, I guess, Memory House, the Blue Notebooks, uh, one of, a couple of other records. But, you know, these were on, these were not, these, these were not projects where you could, like, feed a family <laughs> or even, even a single person, you know, it just wasn't possible. So then I thought, okay, well, that was fun. I wrote that film score. That was great. Let's see if we can do some more. Mm -hmm. And, you know, people... People started calling me after what's with Bashir, so I, I did it, and and uh, so it it was a sort of a lucky accident, really. Um, and you know, over the years, I've actually really come to value that experience. You know, that that sort of collaborative environment, uh, which you know, film at its best can be, um, which is a nice contrast for me to my own work, which is just me sitting in a room on my own, you know, for weeks on end. So, yeah. I think composers are in a really interesting spot and have been for quite a long time since kind of file sharing happened because that obviously that took all money away and um, pop bands could continue because they're on the road the whole time they're able to be on the road but if you're composing and you have to write music 
then you can't be on the road the whole time. So then how do you make the money to, you know, in the old days, Philip Glass or people like this, I mean, they make a record and they're able to live off it very comfortably. But that doesn't exist for most composers these days. Mm. And if you go through the funding system, then you get one performance of your show and that's it. <laughs> so if you want to operate outside of that system and the records aren't, aren't able to bring in money, then how do you negotiate that? And the film was an incredibly lovely way to negotiate that. Mm. Isn't it? Yeah, and it's a creative medium in its own right, which is hugely satisfying to be involved with. One of the things that you've said about um, about you know the early work, you said you know it didn't pay the didn't pay the rent, but you said an interesting thing about you might you might as well make it completely on your own terms because the worst thing to do would be to make it on somebody else's terms. And then for it to not pay the rent. Absolutely <laughs> right. Absolutely right. Yeah. That's our mantra. Yeah, I mean that was always the, the, the feeling, really, because you know, for the first two, you know, records, really there was nobody was really listening apart from like other musicians. Um, so so there wasn't this feeling that um, there was anything sort of to gain by going in any particular direction. Um, so we might as well just, you know, do it how we want to do it. I, w I would just write the music I wanted to hear, basically, um, because there was, I, you know, I never had any expectation that that it would be in any any sort of, you know, success, if you like. So, so in a, in a sense, that there's a great freedom in that, uh, <laughs> because it means, you know, there's no there's just no frame of reference apart from the creative one, which is great. I think that's the same. That's true for all artists, isn't it? Is that the greatest freedoms are when it's when you're able to work completely anonymously and there's no expectation on you. Mm. So, so, and that was the benefit of those years, wasn't it? Is that you yeah. could create this sound world that was entirely your own and and yeah. really inhabit it before, before anyone, you know any before pressures before were on. <laughs> before anyone anyone started listening, apart from the sort of other muso nerds. Yeah. I was uh, I was lucky enough to have Ken Russell as a neighbour for. Um, 20 years or so and Ken um, described something which is it's almost like a sort of form of synesthesia that he said that he would hear music and he would see images and he said there was he just could there was no way he couldn't do that to him those two things were completely connected uh, Julia I wonder whether you have a similar experience of the connection between sound and images and I mean do you I know, I know exactly what Ken meant when he said that. Do you recognise that response? Completely. In fact, I have to try and switch it off sometimes. It can be too much. <laughs> because you, you're, you're putting your own world onto this music so quickly. So I try and dial that down, actually. <laughs> I try and experience the music not like that. I try and force myself to. But yes, absolutely. I think, you're, you know, if you're... It, it's just the way people's minds work, isn't it? And when when your mind works like that, that's that's how you are. And I also think for me, when I when I came to this country, I didn't obviously I came when I was eight or nine. And I didn't speak any English. And it took me a long time to learn English and to read and write in English. And during that period, I think that's when that really developed. Actually, was because you enter this kind of solitary world of imagination, don't you, to to live as a child. And I don't think I've ever left that. <laughs> <laughs> because and that's a, that's a, that's a, that's a, that's a you're always, it's just always in your imagination dreamy right mm. are you are you both trilingual uh well i my first my first language is spanish my second hungarian and my third english but my spanish is mostly gone and my hungarian is baby hungarian mm. really what about yours your... i'm not any hungarian <laughs> no, i'm not hungarian <laughs> i can actually i'm quite good at swearing in hungarian i have no idea where i learned that um, but i just picked it up um no i mean i i you know my first language is german and um and uh i i, I speak some english and um i lived in italy for a while so i've got very bad italian okay if you if you're talking to yourself, this is to both of you, if you're talking to yourself in a room, like say you're doing something, I mean, I talk to myself all the time and it's usually telling myself off. It's usually, oh, you idiot, stupid, you know, whatever it is. Which language do you talk to yourself in? Uh, well, it's different. As Max says, if I'm swearing, it's in Hungarian, always. <laughs> 
That's supposed to be the acid test, isn't it, of what your mother tongue really is? Well, it's where do you, how so, do you swear? So if I'm swearing or talking to my mother, it's both Hungarian. Oh, okay. <laughs> right. Everything else is English nowadays. Yeah. It's funnily enough, I, I sort of switch between English and German, weirdly, because... I mean, we we you know I lived in Berlin. We lived in Berlin for we lived in Berlin for uh, almost ten years. Yeah, right, just so. we were only back in the UK quite recently. Um, but yeah, I sort of I, I sort of use them interchangeably in it. Um, yeah. Okay. The reason I ask this, and it's, it's it's not just a trivial point, is firstly I do think that the way in which one understands the world can be constructed by the language that one uses to understand it. But secondly. When you talk to each other about projects, is there a language of music and a language of visuals that you specifically use? And I ask that because I know somebody who says that they can only discuss music in Italian because they can't find the words for it in English. Well, I, I think um, Max's form of talk, Max talks in music more than he talks in any language. And um, that it has been a skill to try and understand that over the years. <laughs> well, well put. Uh, that was a beautifully English way to to construct construct that sentiment. May I say, Julia? I'm going. Okay, I'm going to ask you to do something. Julia, say what you just said in Hungarian. Nam nam akarom tein leg is nam lene yo. No, I'm not going to. <laughs> but um, okay. but but we do use we do talk a lot using cultural reference points. Okay. Mm. More than I think most people might. Um, and again, being together for, for almost thirty years, there's a whole ton of shared experience we draw yes. on in terms of art. Yeah. Um, and and we do, we that is drawing down of ideas and mm. and little musical phrases are a lot of that. Mm. communication and and, and because <laughs> english isn't our first language either mm. can you give me an example that uh, that the viewers might you know might recognize um of of a cultural touchstone that in a conversation about a piece of work has come up well max talks about tarkovsky a lot <laughs> yeah but uh, well yes films you know films we love i mean those become sources don't they they become a sort of a yeah, like, well, Tarkovsky or, or Robert Altman. A or Bill Viola-esque moment. Bill Viola or, or you know, Joseph Cornell. Or... A lot of photography. Yes, A lot exactly. of photography. It's like Grazia Lautobille, yeah, yeah. So, so, yeah, just all those things that, you know, sort of populate the hinterland of your brain um, because they've been there a long time and they become, in a way, shorthand ways to describe ideas and, and, uh, and feelings. Yeah. So that's, yeah. And do you find yourself doing the? Um, I know there was there, used, there was an old myth about the Cohen brothers that they used to finish each other's sentences, but they genuinely do do it. Um, when you're talking like you are now to me about projects that you've both worked on, do you find yourself completing the other person's thoughts? Because it does seem to me like you. Well, are... yeah, this is hideously this is hideously restrained of us today. <laughs> I mean, we're we're being we're behaving. <laughs> we're trying to give each other space to talk. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> um, if we were sitting around at the dinner table, we would not be talking in quite so kind of spaced <laughs> outly. <laughs> okay, so generally you, you it's it's all you throw it all into the mix and you talk across each other and yeah yeah I'm I'm much more southern in how I express myself. Max is much more northern, so I do much more of the talking. <laughs> but but, uh, but yes. Okay, sorry. Now, for for somebody who doesn't quite get that cultural reference, southern and northern in terms of the UK. No, in terms of European. Ah, fine. Because I was thinking the idea that northerners in the UK don't talk. I just don't get. That. No, no, no. Actually, the opposite here. It's the opposite here, isn't it? It's like Hungarians feel fantastic the more, more further north we go. Um, I think you know hung, the Hungarian um, person. Speaking of stereotypes, but Hungarians, we're we're very different from English people we talk very differently and um, I remember Max coming to visit my family when we were really young we were in our early 20s and he's like why is everybody arguing the whole time and I'm like we're not arguing we're just, this is just 
you know, we're just talking. <laughs> and he was like, but everybody's shouting. I'm like, well, don't, isn't that how you express yourself? <laughs> mm. Mm. So, yeah, we have very different styles. Max, one of the things that's interesting about film and music is that the composer, I remember David Arnold once said that the job of the film composer is to sound like everybody other than themselves and to serve the, you know, the, the will of the director. But you've had, there have been cases with your music in which pieces have been used by filmmakers beyond, you know, beyond your, you, you take a piece like Daylight, for example, and, as, and it has turned up in many different places. How does it feel seeing something that you wrote being used in the context of illustrating a film that you weren't specifically involved in? Hmm. Depends on the film, I, right? Yeah, it really depends. I mean, I mean, one of the things about uh, uh, writing music and releasing music into the world is, um, you know, you then don't know where that music is going to go. You know, that in a way, it's sort of quite interesting and exciting to see how people connect to it, how it connects to people, and you know, all of those sorts of outcomes which I sort of can't predict and have no control over. I'm pretty interested in that, actually. And, um, yeah, certainly when, you know, people ask me, you know, to license pieces into their films, um, I mean, it's very contextual, you know. A um, uh, good example is on the, on the Nature of Daylight, um, you know, that, that uh, use in, in uh, Arrival, uh, which is, I guess, the one that people would mostly know. Uh, you know, that came about through kind of a series of conversations with um, with uh, Johan, uh, who was doing the original score, and uh, with Denis about, you know, what the film was and the meaning of the film and the context of it and all of these kinds of things. So it, it can actually be a really interesting process, even though, you know, I'm not involved directly in the project. Have you ever had an experience in which a piece of music of yours has been used in a context that that, that you thought that I don't un, I don't understand why that piece of music is there at that point? Uh, <laughs> yeah, I mean it's sometimes you, you, you uh, yeah I mean sometimes it sort of can be puzzling, especially things where um, if it's for example if it's broadcast TV, then you know it's it's a thing called blanket license i don't know if people might know what that is but it means they don't have to ask you they can just use it um so quite often you know there'll be some really quite random some things. holiday show or well yeah you just don't you know just, <laughs> what is this on here you know it's, it's like okay um but uh yeah so that that can be interesting yeah but actually all these things are you sort of learn about the work and about the way people hear it so i mean i think it's all it's all kind of interesting in a way you yeah. The the only comparison I can think of is there was a documentary on uh, on on a television program not so long ago and it wasn't very good, and I turned to my partner Linda whilst it was on I said this is rubbish and she said you're in it, and they were, they were <laughs> literally had no idea it was just <laughs> there, there I was an interview that I had done with something there I was and it and it came on at almost exactly the moment that I went this is rubbish. <laughs> That's fantastic. That's really good. Yeah. yeah, it was kind of a grounding experience. So what's going to happen now in terms of voices? How are people going to be able to experience it? What's the time frame? Are we looking at 2021? What's happening? Well, it's really interesting. I mean, obviously, we had a whole bunch of concerts lined up. Because also, I, we didn't really talk about this, but when we say we work together, it's not just the idea generation, but actually getting these things on the road, we're working together as well. Mm. So... So we do a lot of work post the writing of anything for Max. And, and um, so there were a lot of concerts that got cancelled uh, within a half an hour of the lockdown. <laughs> the <laughs> whole year kind of changed. Year. Yeah, um, like everybody. Like for everybody. And then we started to try and set up a whole bunch of new concerts during the year. And they've all been cancelled as well. Um, and now, well, it's absolutely fantastic. There's going to be a, a, a broadcast of it on December 10th. The BBC are broadcasting it, across, and thirteen, I think, thirty-nine countries simultaneously. Is it thirty-nine, yeah. thirty-five mm -hmm. countries simultaneously are broadcasting it? So that's the place where people will next hear it. At least will be then, won't it? Yeah, and we're we're hopeful that in twenty-one, we will be able to somehow play music live again. Uh, the pro the thing is with voices, it's a really big band. You know, seventy-seven players. 
I mean, it's huge, you know. So it's it's just not it's just not a lockdown piece, really. <laughs> um, couldn't be worse in that way. So um, so you know, we're hopeful that as things kind of get back to some kind of normality, maybe in the summertime, we're going to be able to start. We'll be able to start playing again. Mm. One of the things I've always been fascinated by is, um, you know, I, I have a, a, a huge respect for, for for musicians and filmmakers, largely because I can't really understand how either of them have done. I mean, I'm a, you know, I'm, I play double bass, but I don't think that counts as being a, mu- a musician. A bassist is somebody who hangs around with musicians at the back. Um, <laughs> um, but I, one of the things that I really love is talking to people who can talk about music in a way that that, that I understand. Max, you're a very good example of that. The other person who I've always looked towards is Robert Ziegler, who I find talks about music in a way that makes perfect sense and, of course, has been involved in uh, in the Voices project. Um, how do you, how would you and Ziegler, for example, talk about it? Because when when Ziegler talks about music, I think I know exactly what, you, what you're saying, even though I, I couldn't in a million years do it. Well, I mean, Robert's a, he's a brilliant, you know, multi-talented musician, you know, and um, the thing about uh, someone like him is when you give him a score, he gets it, you know, I don't really have to tell Robert sort of what I'm trying to do because it, it's on the page and I'll give him the page and he'll go, okay, he gets it, right? And, that, and, that, and that's just because he's really good at what he does. And he's a really, you know, he's an excellent conductor, but he's, but he's an all-round musician, you know, he's a musical yeah. guy. And, um, and that's the sort of, you know, the magical part of, you know, all those decades of training and experience. Um, you know, if it's on the page, then it's on the stage, as they say. And Yulia, when you're doing your filmmaking, who do you look to to say, yeah, okay, that's, that's working, or I don't get it? I don't. <laughs> I mean, Max tries to sometimes say stuff, but <laughs> um, I, I try not to, actually. I try not to show it to anybody until it's finished. I mean, that's kind of why I like working outside of the film world, because in the real film world, you can't be doing that, can you? You've got, you've got committees and you've got yeah. people writing reports after press, you know, test screenings and all sorts, and, and I would be useless under those conditions. So I try and do filmmaking at a level where it's pretty much, you know, like a poet might write something or, you know, it's very much about self-expression. So something like the Mercy video is just me going, Poof here you go <laughs> and and kind of sitting there and and editing away and 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 there it is so and and you know that we I've made a lot of videos to accompany Max's music over the years and you know if if we think of you know path 5 or or dream 13 which I made because Max has no he has no pictures of his childhood he has one one picture only from his whole childhood and I wanted to make him a video about childhood memory so so that you know, again, that's me dreaming about that and dreaming myself into that space and using using the rhythms of his music to reflect that. I think there's something wonderful about that, actually, though, that you can take a sort of a process that you might, you know, might, might be more natural to, say, a painter or a novelist and apply that to cinema. I mean, that, that's quite a new thing, actually, to be able to... I mean, you know, there have been in former times, you know, uh, sort of eccentric soul filmmakers, but... You know, it's 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 more manageable now something because like of Chris Mark or somebody. Yeah, like exactly. Yeah, using it almost like the diary filmmakers, isn't it? It's yeah. like the diary. That's probably that's more my tradition than mainstream yeah. filmmaking. Isn't I it? mean, Marker is a Marker is a particularly interesting example because it's like that's whenever anyone says, "Okay, describe that for me," you go, "You just have to see it, really. <laughs> you yeah. really do." <laughs> yeah, it's fantastic really filmmaker. Very it's just yeah, all those contradictions you know <laughs> yeah yeah I mean and 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 and, and I mean I, I remember the first time I think the first time I was shown La Jete and I just remember going I have absolutely no idea what this is I think it's brilliant but I have I just don't know what it actually is right, yeah mm. what just happened you know yeah, <laughs> yeah yeah well look that seems like a you know a good place to bring this to a conclusion I just want to say for, for both of you um I, I'm. I, it's wonderful to see such a, such a brilliantly collaborative uh, relationship, but the fact is, you are producing really genuinely multi-dimensional works of art. I'm a huge fan, as I as I hope you both know, 
Uh, I, I'm very much looking forward to the BBC broadcast once again. It's on the it's on the tenth. Yeah. Yeah, on the tenth. Radio probably. three on the tenth in the evening at some point. Yeah. Mm. Brilliant. Well, I look I look forward to that, and I hope that everybody uh, tunes into that. And uh, I hope to see you both in the flesh in uh, 2021. I know that uh, you know the BFI show that I do monthly will hopefully be back in the BFI South Bank. Then I'd like to invite you both to come on it and. Uh, and talk about the work more with an actual live audience, because heaven knows, I think we could all do with some actual, genuine, physical sharing of space. Uh, absolutely. Yeah, that'd be yeah. lovely. Good one. Thanks. Thanks very much. Good to talk to you, Mark. If you enjoyed this event, please consider donating to the BFI. They're a charity, and their venues have been closed during the most recent lockdown, so your support helps the BFI keep going. Thanks for watching. Thanks for your support, and good night.